how do you do everybody and thank you for joining us on this journey which a great bird a sunbird invited all the birds of the world to follow and we're going to follow those birds in special tribute to the memory of our dear departed colleague Leonard Lewison, one of the great scholars of Persian literature and Sufi thought of our time. His memory never leaves us and as we now embark on the canticle of the birds, just a few words to say, canticle of the birds and not conference of the birds. Conference of the birds? Press conference of the birds? What a crazy title for a masterpiece of spiritual literature that was produced by the poet Attar of northeastern Iran somewhere around the turn of the 12th and 13th centuries AD. We're not quite sure. Canticle sounds like the original title, Mantiq, Mantiq. The canticle of the birds is our allusion to the canticle of the canticles or song of songs that is Solomon's because the birds fly in following the bird of Solomon himself, the hoopoe. So this is truly the canticle of the birds. And we're also thinking of the wonderful poem by St. Francis of Assisi, Il Cantico delle Creature, the canticle of all the creatures, because a song is what the birds raise to the glory of the Lord. Not a conference but a canticle. So when we look at this painting here, if we can begin to dim the lights now. We are filming, so I can't dim them too oh, much. So, uh, oh, I don't have to be seen. These things are what deserve it. When we look at a picture like this, which is only a detail of a marvelous manuscript page painted by a Hindu artist, Miskeen, as he called himself, the miserable one, the wretched one, out of humility, painting for Emperor Akbar and showing that at the turn of the 16th and 17th centuries, Hindu artists in Mughal service had such an understanding of Persian literature and Sufi symbolism as to make us 400 years later rather ashamed of ourselves that we should miss so many symbols that these Hindu painters, so deeply literate in Persian at the turn of the 16th and 17th centuries, already mastered. So even though this is a detail to an illustration on animal fables, Miskeen, the painter, in a corner, brings alive the whole theme of Attar's great poem, The Canticle of the Birds, because this manuscript was one of the greatest sources of inspiration for the Iranians, the Central Asians, and the Indians for centuries. It is one of the masterpieces of all Sufi literature. So we see here the great bird, the sunbird. It is a symbol of the sun. Its design is ultimately derived from the Chinese phoenix, the Feng Huang, but which the West Asian Muslims adopted after the Chinese influences that sort of flowed over the entire Near East in the wake of the Mongol Empire and invasions of the 13th century. So they adopted this design to render the concept that goes very far back in pre-Islamic Persian mythology. This bird is called in Persian the Seymour, of course. Seymour, often mistranslated by a masculine, in fact goes back to a very ancient Avestic Persian word which recognized gender differences in the grammar. And the word was Saena Merira meaning my lady eagle bird. She is a feminine, she is a mother bird. She protects her chicks and she guides our souls mother-like. She represents the sun because she is a stylized eagle and in practically universal mythology, the sun 
is symbolized by a predatory bird, either a hawk or an eagle, sometimes as in Egypt, a vulture, but always such a predatory bird. So she is the monarch towards which all the birds of the world fly because all the birds symbolize different kinds of human souls. Miskin, the painter, summarizes the cosmology by showing first the cosmic mountain which unites earth and heaven, called Mount Qaf in Islamic languages, which is ultimately derived from the Arabic pronunciation of the Greek pronunciation of the Caucasus Mountains. Kafkasos in medieval Greek, Kaf in the Islamic languages. But here it doesn't represent any particular mountain on earth. It represents the same symbolic mountain that we have in Judaism and all the religions that derive from that tradition, Mount Sinai, or the Greek tradition, Mount Olympus, or the Japanese tradition, the Fujiyama, the Indian tradition, the Himalayas, and Mount Meru. It is the cosmic mountain. It is the link between Earth and Heaven. We see that the opposite of the eagle bird, who represents the sun, is the dragon, who represents darkness, chaos, and primordial waters. And the ancients represent the triumph of the sun over darkness by a combat between the predatory eagle or falcon vanquishing a dragon. The design of the dragon also ultimately derives from Chinese examples, which so much influenced the West Asians after the 13th century. So between the eagle bird and the dragon, we have the soul birds and the poet Atar at the turn of the 12th and 13th centuries is going to use every kind of bird to symbolize a particular kind of human soul from ducks to cranes to falcons. But you will notice that a number of partridges are not flying. They are not flying because they represent in Atar's poem those souls of certain human beings who are so sluggish and attached to material things that like the partridges that are constantly scratching for pebbles, they remain tied to the earth and they cannot take spiritual flight. And the painter further signifies this by contrasting the dry, withered stumps assorted with these birds that remain tied to the ground in contrast to the tree in bloom in eternal spring which rises towards the heavens. Now when we get an image like this we first have to be reminded of the context in which it was created and I'm taking you here to the city where the most beautiful manuscript in all the world of the Canticle of the Birds, of the Mantequotair, was created, the city of Herat, capital of a 15th century kingdom, and today part of Western Afghanistan. What we see here is the great shrine of Herat. The city itself and its oasis is in the distance, and here is buried the patron saint of the city, the great Sufi poet of the 11th century, Khaja Abdullah Ansari. And so the kings, queens of Herat are buried in the precincts of the shrine. Watch this now. Here is the entrance to the shrine, raised in the 15th century by the prime minister of Herat, Mirali Sher Nawai, who himself will translate Attar's great poem into his own Turkish language, as the lisan the language of the birds. So he raises this wonderful gateway, which we recognize as so typically Persianate, but we have something very strange about just this building, which is that in front of it is the statue of a dog, stylized. And we're going to take a closer look at it here. What is a 
dog carved in marble in the 15th century doing in front of the gateway to a shrine. So, answer. When I came to Herat shortly after the overthrow of the Taliban government in 2001, I went to see my friends at the great mosque there and I asked them what had become of the dog because we had been told that it had disappeared and we assumed that the Taliban had destroyed it. And my friends at the Great Mosque said, oh no, it has not been destroyed. We'll tell you what's become of the dog if you can tell us what it means. Oh, well, I said, the only dog I can think of is referred to in the 18th surah of the Quran, according to which, taking up a famous Christian tradition, seven young people fleeing pagan persecution entered a cave and their tame dog crouched at the mouth of the cave. And then God, in his mercy, closed the mouth of the cave and put the seven young people to sleep for centuries. The persecutors never found them. And when God woke up the seven sleepers of Ephesus, they emerged with their tame dog and found themselves in a world which had converted to their faith. So this is a very famous story, and I said that this dog that is called in Islamic tradition Kitmir must be the dog represented here. They said that's exactly that. And you know what that means? That means that the shrine itself symbolizes the holy cave. And that the kings and queens of Herat who sleep inside awaiting judgment day are the ones who are symbolized by the seven sleepers. We sleep and we await the resurrection. And the dog, so loyal and so tame, represents our animal personality, our flesh, duly subdued by higher intellect and rendered obedient. So this is the symbolism of the shrine and it gives us an idea of the architectural atmosphere of the city which created the world's most beautiful manuscript of the Manticotair, of the Canticle of the Birds. So now that we've seen this dog here, just a little story. My friends told me but just before the Taliban entered the city in 1996, they were so afraid that the dog would be destroyed that they created a little brick structure around it, covered it with earth, planted flowers, and the Taliban never knew it was there. And now they said, come, we're going to uncover the dog. Well, we'll uncover some more things here. Here we have a wonderful representation of the spiritual elite of the kingdom of Herat in the years 1480s when the manuscript that they commissioned was created. So the original is no bigger than a playing card. It is a page now in the Metropolitan Museum of Art detached from what had been the collected poems of Hafiz. It is by the great master of Herat himself, Bezad, and this is what we're going to discover. Here we see somebody weeping. There he is. Who can he possibly be? This is supposed to be the poetry of Hafiz, but we are watching a dervish dance and we see people playing the flute, and we are reminded of the opening verses of the spiritual couplets of Maulana Rumi. Listen to the song of the reed flute, how it sings of the pain of separation ever since they have torn me as a reed from the reed bed and transformed me into a flute. Men and women, to listen to my song, weep. So. The character who weeps is Rumi himself. And this is the oldest representation of Rumi in existence.
Just studying this painting under a microscope at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, we've been able to identify many of these characters in what is, in fact, one of the most important representations of the giants of Persian literature in existence. So how do we know it's Rumi? Well, we have this manuscript, which is now in Washington, D.C. at the Freer, which was created in Herat in the late 15th century and then received this beautiful frontispiece in the early 16th century under the Safavid dynasty. So you have these typical Safavid pointed turbans like this. And it is the frontispiece to the complete works of Rumi. Indeed. So we have a king watching the dervish dance. And here we have the poet again, and we see that it's a convention. He weeps. He weeps over our condition. Our condition is like chess pieces pushed back and forth between night and day, between the black squares and the white squares. He meditates over our human condition. And you have the river of life flowing and its water rises and gives the sap that allows this tree to flourish. This is the tree of life and we'll see it recur again and again in the art of this civilization. Not one detail of which is gratuitous or devoid of meaning. There's a famous treatise attributed to Ibn Arabi, so that would be early 13th century, the great Spanish Arab mystic, read and commented upon abundantly in the 15th century kingdom of Herat, and which says one can compare all the universe to a great tree, and every branch, every leaf, every fruit of this tree represents a different aspect of existence. And when the tree of the universe beheld the insan et mille, the perfect human being, the tree trembled in the multiplicity of its colors and bowed lovingly towards him. In Arabic, in Ibn Arabi's Arabic. So the tree is represented in this tradition. We'll see it throughout Iranian, Central Asian, and North Indian painting as a typical Iranian and Central Asian plane tree, chinar, depicted with autumn foliage to render the multiplicity of colors, whereas uh, I think um, botanically this is impossible given that here you have a tree in spring flowers. So that this is no moment of the year in particular. These are spiritual states. Spiritual states also indicated by, again, the dry stumps that you see here. This is because Ibn Arabi wrote, those branches of the tree of life that have become detached and are no longer reached by the water of life are like dry, withered stumps. And they represent souls in spiritual despair. So you have the cosmology here that we're going to see again and again. Further notice, of course, these pages were produced for kings, for royalty. So they use gold and lapis lazuli powder rinsed in linseed oil in abundance. Malachite for the green, cinnabar for the red, orpiment for the yellow, but silver tarnishes. So all these streams and rivers and seascapes that you see in 15th and 16th century paintings that were created for kings then and used to shine as silver now appear to us as these abstract black spaces. But that's only because the silver is tarnished. So this gives us a further idea of the world into which we are entering. Here are the details then of the dervish dance. It has become a curious habit uh, for scholars of 
Islamic art, Persian art, North Indian art, Central Asian art, to concentrate in the 20th century on kings. For what king, for what prince was this painted? And it's very important to decide which painter in which city for which prince was doing this. In fact, these painters were called upon to offer visual meditation on deeply spiritual texts. And if we divorce these paintings from the literature on which they offer their meditation, we are running the risk of only seeing these things as superficial compositions of bright colors. When we talk about this painting as one of the most significant in all Islamic art in terms of the representations of the great Sufi figures, poets, we find that we have here Hafiz himself, here, who is showing his respect by hiding his hands in the long sleeves of his coat, chapan, because traditional Islamic etiquette requires that in the presence of a superior you should hide your hands. That's also in Chinese etiquette. Further, he wears a pink robe, kaboye gulgun, rose-colored. Why? Because it is drenched in the wine that represents his heart's blood. So this is indeed another convention. Rumi weeps, and Hafiz wears the pink rose-colored robe. But then we have these two characters here. It took me a little while to figure out who they were. Lo and behold, they are none the, no less than the two patrons of the manuscript that we're going to be looking at of the Canticle of the Birds. This is the Prime Minister of the Kingdom of Herat, Mir Ali Shiri Nawai, shown from the life in about 1490. And here, his spiritual advisor, a great Sunni theologian and great Persian language poet, who was recognized in his day as the single most influential Sunni theologian from Istanbul all the way to the Muslim communities in southeastern China for his commentaries on Ibn Arabi. This was Jami. Now, it is astonishing to see that Islamic art is supposed to be forbidden in terms of figural representation. And yet here we see the Prime Minister of Herat and his spiritual advisor, both represented from the life. These are portraits taken from the life. Not this, but these two are. And they allowed it. How is this possible? And what they are watching is not some clandestine scene. This is the Samat the Rumi ritual itself, the dance of the dervishes. So again, you can ask, how do you know who these people are? Well, watch the process of identification. We have Nawai, Jami, Hafiz, Rumi. Here, we had a portrait of Mir Ali Shere Nawai, the prime minister of Herat, by a Herati artist called Muhammad the Mahmoud Muzahib, meaning Mahmoud the Gilder. So we have this absolutely authentic portrait of the Prime Minister, who further translated Attar's poem into Turkish, in his, his own Eastern Turkish language. He's now considered the national poet of Uzbekistan, because that's the language they use. And we see that that is the character. And this is also the convention, represented leaning on his staff, and by comparing the images this way, we were able to discover his identity. So we have here Nawai, who died in 1501, and facing him, because always accompanying him in the art of late 15th century Herat, his spiritual advisor, Jami, whom we will see plays an absolutely central role in the history of Islamic art for being the most important theologian to justify figurative painting and protect the work of the painter, Be'ezad. So Nawai Jami, these two key figures, both of them 
ask their Sultan, Sultan Hussein Mirza Baikara of Herat, Your Majesty, the poet Attar is buried in your territory. Just a day or two's horseback ride away from Herat at Nishapur. Erect a great shrine, but more important, create the most beautiful manuscript possible of his poetry. So we don't know if this wonderful character in the dervish dance is Bezad's vision of Attar. We don't know who this wonderful person is. What we can admire is the actual size of this character is as big as the fingernail of your pinky. And to be able to paint with such extraordinary detail signified for a 15th century master holding a bottle full of water, a glass bottle, over the picture so that he could see the detail. With a brush of squirrel hairs, three squirrel hairs brought together in a point to obtain the necessary finesse. So I'm looking for Attar. I'm still with Navai here. In the paintings that were added to the manuscript in the early 17th century in Isfahan, we see this character here, who is obviously Attar's Turkic translator, the minister Navai. And yet, in the 17th century painting, we finally get Attar. This may be by Habibullah of Mashhad, maybe by Rezaia Abbasi, we're not sure, represents the poet Attar himself, explaining his poem, written in about the year 1200, to the minister of Herat, Navai, leaning on his staff. You are going to translate me into Turkish. You must understand what I say. Uh, have you noticed, for those of you who are very familiar with modern Iran, how all these classics of Persian literature are usually published with kind of ridiculous illustrations depicting supposedly what the poet was supposed to look like. And they've usually been just designed right out of somebody's brain in the 1950s and 1960s. It seems that the time could come to use these wonderful earlier paintings to suggest Rumi, Hafez, Attar, Saadi, and all the rest of them. So Attar Navoi. We're talking about the great manuscript of the Canticle of the Birds, which was supposed to be completed in the year 1487 AD, but was not. Several pages remained blank. The pictures were never painted in. And so when the dynasty of Herat fell in 1507, and Herat was annexed to the Safavid kingdom of Iran in 1510, the wonderful book came into the possession of the Safavid rulers. And in 1609, more than 100 years later, Shah Abbas in Isfahan ordered the manuscript to be rebound for presentation forever to the Safavid family shrine where the Safavid kings are buried at Ardabil in northwestern Iran. So this wonderful binding is Isfahani work of the early 17th century. We're really talking about a royal treasure. And the pages were remounted on wonderful marbled paper in the margins here. But the calligraphy itself is another masterpiece of Herat's art. It is the work of Sultan Ali Mashadi, who is considered in the 1480s, 1490s, to be the finest calligrapher in the world, at least in the Muslim world. And you have the lapis lazuli and the gold and the cursive, Naskh, for the titles, and you have the suspended cursive so typical of Persian and Turkish, called Nastaliq, Nastaliq, suspended cursive. So a wonderful page of this calligraphy, considered irreplaceable, so remounted, and another page of this wonderful calligraphy. And so and then we have the kings who are involved in the production. First, the king of Herat in the late 15th century, 
Sultan Hussein Mirza by Qara, very Turkic, very East Asian looking. This is the work of Master Bizad, at least if we can believe the calligraphy which was added by a great Herati scribe of the 16th century and also a great chronicler of the arts, Master Dost Muhammad. Dost Muhammad they caught him. Master Muhammad, the Dost Muhammad the scribe. And Bizad created then this picture of the king. And you will note perhaps a kind of blur in the outline because these were created with tiny pinpricks with a needle so that this page could be held over another page and charcoal dust would be allowed to dribble through the holes and recreate the outline below, which the student could then fill out. This was also used in the Italian Renaissance. Leonardo da Vinci did it all the time for his students. Sporverato, it is powdered, and known as pouncing in English. And this way the image of the king, for example, could be sent to various districts of the kingdom so people would know what the king looked like. You will notice further that Sultan Hussein Mirza bin Qara, exactly as Prince Babur of Kabul describes him, the chest of a lion in a very narrow waist, also has a kerchief in his hand. A kerchief, you would imagine, is just an absolutely frivolous, secondary, unimportant detail. Not at all. In 15th and 16th century Islamic art, all the way to the end of the Mughal dynasty in the 19th century, only royalty are shown with such a kerchief either in the fist or tucked into the belt because it derives an Islamic heraldry from the kerchief which was brandished by the Roman consuls and then by the Byzantine emperors. A kerchief by which the Roman or Byzantine authority would cast such a signal into the arena and that would begin either the gladiatorial combats with wild animals or the chariot races and this became as in the 6th century AD ivory from Constantinople a symbol of imperial power and this called mappa in Latin whence our word map M-A-P-P-A was adopted into the heraldry of the caliphs of Baghdad in turn and so designates royalty. So you see, not a detail goes gratuitously. And then here, the next king we have is Shah Abbas in Isfahan at the beginning of the 17th century, who will also order his artists to add further paintings to this manuscript, transforming it into a virtual museum of the finest Persianate painting in the world. That here, Shah Abbas was painted by a Hindu artist who was a member of a Mughal Indian embassy to the court at Isfahan. Again, demonstrating how much Hindus are involved in this civilization. And we have the names then of these great artists. Bezad, who paints Sultan Hussein Mirza of Herat in 1487, and Bishindas, which means servant of Vishnu, a Hindu, Bishn, Vishnu. Das, servant, who paints Shah Abbas in Isfahan and perhaps also in Ardabil, since that's where the manuscript will be presented in 1609. So here are the three places that we can associate with this manuscript, and it's a remarkable story. Herat, where it was created in 1487, but never quite finished. Then in Isfahan, it was completed in 1609 for presentation to the great shrine where the Safavid kings are buried in northwestern Iran at Ardabil. It was part of the library attached to the shrine as a pious endowment. So that artists from the entire Safavid kingdom could come and consult this model of supreme art so that this manuscript became a kind of the blueprint for Safavid art for the rest of the 17th century. So famous. In 1722, as the Safavid empire was collapsing, 
a Russian army sent by Peter the Great moved down along the western coast of the Caspian as far as Tabriz in Iran, took Ardabil, pillaged it, it was only recalled because Peter the Great himself died, and the manuscript disappeared. Gone to Russia? Who knows? But in 1963, the manuscript resurfaced in Herat, in western Afghanistan, the property of a gentleman called Mr. Ismail Parwanta, who decided to sell it to the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, and that is how the very last glorious Timurid manuscript left Afghan soil, perhaps forever. That's how these things happen. Fortunately, fashions have changed. If the book had reached uh, the Western art market before the middle of the 20th century, it would probably have been cut up, as most of these Persian books were, just to keep the paintings framed on the wall, excised from their literary context forever. But after the middle of the 20th century, especially after Arthur Houghton cut up the famous Book of Kings of Shah Ta Mosp, you know, sell this to the Metropolitan, sell that to the Aga Khan collection, and so forth, by selling it piecemeal, you make a fortune. Fortunately, now these books are kept together in their coherence. So that's the kind of bibliophiliac adventure. And then we get this painting, also created for the Sultan of Herat, by Bizad himself, who will be chosen by the royal court at Herat to illustrate Attar, because only the most qualified artist, spiritually and technically, could possibly be retained to illustrate such a book. Now, here, I'm going to go one up over what I described earlier to you as the most significant literary painting in Islamic art. This is the single most significant painting in all Islamic art. Now you can say, how can you say such a thing? What do you mean? How dare you? Okay, let's go. This was painted in 1488, more or less the same time as the Canticle of the Birds by Bizad. How do you know it's by Bizad? Because he signed it. He did? Where? He signed it on the win just over the window here. In the usual way, Amar al-Abd Bizad. This is the work of the servant of God, Bizad. So it's absolutely authentic. This painting, part of a manuscript of the orchard of uh, Saadi, the orchard, the um, Bustan of Saadi, is now, as it passed through the Ottoman Empire, is kept in the National Library in Cairo, but it was exhibited in Paris in 1903 at the Musée des Arts Décoratifs in the great first pioneering exhibition of Islamic art in 20th century Europe. And the person who was most overwhelmed by the vision of this painting was Matisse. Matisse said, this painting taught me how to paint. This painting taught me to abandon the smoky colors of traditional European art, to abandon illusionistic perspective, to appreciate a painting as a surface with an assemblage of gloriously assembled primary colors. You'll see in Matisse's art how his flat surface will just be enlivened by diagonals to tease the eye into thinking this could possibly be a three-dimensional space. But in fact, it's a one-dimensional space were it not for the two characters floating across it just as characters do in the art of Matisse. So this painting by Bizad has, through Matisse, actually influenced all modern art. Think of Mondrian, for example. It is typically Islamic insofar as it reproduces the kind of decoration you would see in the Great Mosque of Herat, or indeed in any royal mosque anywhere in the world from Morocco to Bengal. Bizad, like any artist in 15th century Herat, was also expected to design the tile work of the Great Mosque. And what you see are, first, calligraphy. Calligraphy 
Arabic script is to Muslims in a mosque what the figure of Jesus Christ is to Christians in a church. That is the word of God made visible to human eyes. The Quran is read because it is written. And it is recited and can be heard because it is written. So you have calligraphy, the sacred art of Arabic script, even though these are Persian poems. Then you have the tendrils in spring flowering of the tree of life. Everywhere, these abstract vegetation motifs, a style which is called in medieval Persian Islimi Bargi, meaning leaf like Islimi. Nobody knows what the word Islimi really means. The Moroccan craftsmen use words like tashjir and tawriq, which means that which is tree-like and that which is leaf-like. So you get in Spanish from the Arabic a taurique for this type of art, meaning leaf-like. Islimi was considered by the Persian-speaking writers as a pun on Islami, as if it were the quintessential Islamic art. And it was believed by Dost Muhammad the scribe, who wrote one of our best chronicles in the 16th century, that the Caliph Ali himself, the Prophet's son-in-law and kinsman, first wrote a page of Quranic calligraphy, then dipped his finger into the inkwell and traced this foliage. So Ali was considered to be the patron saint of the guild of artists of the book until the end of the 15th century. Just as in Christian civilization, St. Luke, who was supposed to have painted a portrait of the Virgin and Child, was the patron saint of all painters in Christian lands. It's very, very similar as a holy idea. However, we add to this second motif a third, and you see these geometric designs. If you look very carefully at all this geometry in abstract Islamic art, you will note that these designs are actually either star patterns or sun patterns, shamsa, meaning these are the stars of heaven or the sun. Combine the tree and the stars and you have the gardens of heaven. You enter such a room and you are in a representation of heaven. So suddenly the various designs in their infinite variety become extremely meaningful. In the poem, Bizad illustrates verses by Saadi of Shiraz, written in the 13th century, telling the very famous story among Jews, Christians, and Muslims of Joseph, sold as a slave in Egypt, to the family of the Prime Minister of Pharaoh, and the wife of the Prime Minister fell in love with her handsome slave and tried to entrap him in a wonderful palace whose seven doors were closed, shut, locked, so that she could seduce Joseph, who, chaste as he was, tore himself away from her adulterous embrace, and she was left with nothing but a shred of cloth from the back of his tunic as he tore himself away. So naturally, she accused him to her husband when her husband came home. Joseph ended up in prison. And then after many adventures, which are told in Genesis and also told in the 12th surah of the Quran, Joseph, having interpreted Pharaoh's dreams, ends up as prime minister of Egypt. But this particular story, this is very little known to Jews and Christians today, was elaborated by the Greek-speaking Jews of Alexandria in the third century AD into a Neoplatonic romance in which the lady came to symbolize the human soul, moved with yearning for the beauty of the divine reflected on the countenance of Joseph. So that this was the first stage in her spiritual ascent from terrestrial love 
to spiritual love. According to this 3rd century AD or early 4th century AD Greco-Egyptian Jewish romance, the lady ends up as a widow, disgraced, poor, a beggar in the streets of the Egyptian capital, whereas Joseph rides by in all his youthful glory as the prime minister, as the Aziz of Pharaoh. And Zuleicha, as she's called in Islamic languages, reaches out to the handsome Joseph and says, I have sinned against you. Forgive me. I did not realize that my love for you was the love for the beauty of the divine mirrored upon your face. Look upon me with the eye of mercy if you can forgive me and recognize me. And Joseph looks upon her with the eye of mercy and she is suddenly transformed back into the lovely Egyptian princess which she once was. And so Joseph falls in love with her and weds her. And on their wedding night, it is Joseph who becomes so overcome with desire that he clutches at her dress as she tears herself playfully away and he finds himself with a shred of cloth in his fist. And the roles have been reversed because the story is a symbol of the fusion of the human soul and the divine and the fusion becomes so complete that they change places. Corresponds very much to Hindu mysticism and the story of Raja and Krishna. Very, very similar. In Islamic literature, it is certainly Jami of Herat, who in 1484 produced the most famous Persian language rendition of this story. So the question has been raised, how was Bezad permitted at the court of the Sultan to represent this story, which was obviously a royal command, given the fortune invested just in the pigments. How was he able to do this without Jami, the spiritual advisor to the Sultan, not knowing about it and not even permitting it? Well, here again is where a little research opens the key, opens the door to many mysteries. The verses by Jami's, by Jami from his poem are inserted in the tile work. And what do these verses say? First, the key to much of this art is dual illustration, whereby the painter in this very literate culture illustrates one poet in this case, Saadi, with visual allusions to a second poet, in this case, Jami. Just as in Western civilization, if I see Prokofiev's ballet, Romeo and Juliet, or if I see uh, Bernstein's adaptation as West Side Story, it is expected, if I'm not to be considered a total illiterate, that I will recognize the Romeo and Juliet Shakespearean prototype. So you have these motifs that circulate back and forth. Now, what is really important is what Johnny actually says. He says words like, Okay, translation. The artist who created this palace is so skilled that if he painted the image of a bird upon a stone, the very stone would sprout wings and fly because it would have received the living soul. Indeed, it would be like the bird of Christ. This is an illusion which Jami took deliberately to a famous verse in the Quran. And this is the only Christian representation I've ever been able to find of it from a 12th century Romanesque church in Switzerland. According to this Christian tradition, which the Quran consecrates as the main miracle of Christ offered to the medita meditation of Muslim mystics. Christ child, Jesus, is supposed to have molded birds of clay, 
breathed upon them and given them life. And the Quran adds, and God speaks, with my permission, Ba'ithni, signifying in Sufi interpretation, our souls are spiritually dead. And then Jesus breathes the breath of life, intelligence, ruh, the spirit, ruh, in Hebrew, pnevna, spiritus, and all those languages, breathes this life into our souls and brings us to the resurrection of spiritual life. The other miracle mostly associated with Jesus in Quranic meditation is the resurrection of Lazarus. The dead brought to life with God's permission signifying the spiritual awakening. The impact of this illusion that Jami brought was to make Bezad recognized as a Sufi master whose painting does not turn away our eyes from the Creator, but rather through the beauty of creation directs us to the Creator. He is assimilated to the Christ of the Quran. He is supposed to have the nafasi masihi, the Christ breath. And so Bizad's art was sanctified. And thereafter, throughout the 16th century literature in Persian and also in Turkish, from Istanbul to Delhi, Bezad was recognized as the patron saint of this art. And for the figurative painters, he succeeds Ali himself. So this is another reason why what the painting we just saw was the most significant in all Islamic art. It is the overturning of the prohibition. So Bezad now. Here we have a representation from the same manuscript of Saadi of the great mosque of Herat. A beggar tries to be admitted into the mosque. The keeper of the mosque refuses admittance and the beggar says in Arabic from Saadi, Man lahu, he who knocketh upon the door, it shall be opened unto him, right out of the words of Christ in the Gospels. But very interesting for us is this character here. I was able to decipher what it says on the little notebook, and lo and behold, we have the one and only authentic self-portrait of Bizad himself. Now, if we don't show that in Kabul, what are we doing? This is extraordinary. Another character, very interesting, is, I'm sorry, here. This character appears again and again in the art of Herat, and it represents the archetypical poet and master of spiritual initiation. With outstretched hands, welcoming you into the shrine. And he is a Bizadian variant of a notion by Avicenna, Ibn Sina, the great 11th century philosopher, who in his allegories compares the appearance of the holy intelligence breathing into our minds like the breath of Christ, which can appear as the archangel Gabriel, which in, announced unto Mary the birth of Christ, or the text of the Quran unto Muhammad, or indeed can appear as the wonderful sunbird herself, in feminine form, as the Simur, or yet as a wonderful, wise old man in whom all the majesty of great age appears and none of the infirmity. Hayyab ibn Yaqsan, the living one, son of the awakener. So this character is another stock symbol of this art. Here, the gathering of the poets. This was painted in Herat in 1486 by Qasim Ali. And again, you see the prime minister, Nawai, here, hiding his hands in the long sleeves of his kaftan next to Jami, his spiritual advisor. So they were both painted from the life, with my permission. And they are carried in a vision, which is the Nawai, the poet's vision, into the dream garden of the great Persian language poets of the past. Nawai writes in Turkish, and Jami introduces him to Nizami of Azerbaijan. 
to Amir Khosrow of Delhi, to Saadi, Firdausi, Sanai, Khokani, Anwari, Abul Hassan Dehrami, meaning like in the fourth canto of Dante's Divine Comedy, behold, the poet who writes in a new language is introduced into the great company of the classical poets of the past. He writes in Turkish. He is worthy now to sit with the great Persian language poets. This is the frontispiece to the great manuscript of Nawawi, which also includes his Turkish translation of the Canticle of the Birds. We are in a paradise garden, of course. If you look up, you see the moon, you see the crescent, you will never see a moon like that in a real physical sky. Because in a real moon, the horns of the crescent always point upwards. Here, in this art, it points downwards because it shows veneration for the poet, and the poet is configured, again, as the wise old sage of initiation, one of the possible configurations of the divine intelligence that inspires us. So let's see what we have here. This is the wonderful variation on the theme by Muhammad Ali of Golconda in the Indian Deccan in the early 17th century. Same motif with the new shading brought in from contact with the European Renaissance. The famous poet in a garden preserved in the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, but you can see that it is the same archetype of the poet as the Lesson Raib, the language of the unseen world, or the Ayinaya Raib, meaning the mirror of the unseen world. So here we have an illustration done in Mashhad by Master Abdul Aziz in the 1560s for the Safavid Prince Ibrahim Mirza, and it shows in illustration to Jami's poetry a disciple peering through a crack in the door at Saadi at night, inspired by the angels. So this is the idea of the poet as one who relays the mysteries of the unseen world to the unworthy ones that we are. And with Bezad, he will be appointed in 1522 by Shah Ismail as Grand Master of all the artists of the book with the title of Mazkare Nawadere Sowa, meaning the manifestation of the rarities of the archetypal images in the mind of God. Platonic ideas. So, the manuscript. We're going to be looking at the pictures that were created in the late 15th century in this first session. We'll see the 17th century ones in the next session. This was an illustration to one of the stories in Atar's poem, No Birds Here in a Very Human World, and it represents a beggar kneeling in front of a prince. The beggar, the lowest form of society, the prince, the highest form of society. This was painted by Bizal's own master, Mirakri Nakkalsh, Mirak the painter, and so Mirak represented himself as the beggar out of humility. This is one of the earliest self-portraits we have in all Persianate art. Now there are other mysteries here besides what you see here. Laf. This was written in the early 17th century when the book was presented as an endowment of Laf to the shrine of Dabir. We get the little games in the calligraphy. This can be read as house, manzil, or it can be read as mirat, the signature of the painter himself. Or here we have the prince. So now that you're all experts, he has the kerchief. Only royalty. And he has the seal of Solomon representing the holy king, the ruler of the world with God's permission. And then we have this very strange detail. There's a young man who's looking at the scene between the beggar and the prince and doesn't understand what's happening. And this is Mirak's own visual meditation added to Atar's poem. 
He is asking a Chinese ambassador, what is possibly happening? What is the mystical meaning of this scene? Now, if I'm just an art historian, I say, well, Kingdom of Herat in the 15th century and the Ming King Kingdom of Beijing in the 15th century enjoyed tremendous relations. We know that caravans were going back and forth with gifts between China and the Herati Kingdom. Many Chinese influences on Herati art, but we must go much more deeply. Attar tells us in his poem that the great sunbird rises in the most distant east on the side of the rising sun, perched upon a high mountain on the edge of the world. And the hoopoe leads all the other birds eastward out of this material darkness in which we live towards the spiritual sunrise of intelligence dawning upon our souls. So that the entire poem reads like a meditation on a famous saying attributed to the Prophet Muhammad, but search for wisdom even if it lies in China. With China symbolizing the rising dawn of intelligence in mystical poetry and mystical painting. So that is what this means. Then here, for those of you who like mullahs and Taliban and people like that, here is one of Bizad's most ferocious caricatures of all, because it reflects a ferocious caricature in Attar's poem. What is happening? What is really happening is the top of the painting, and then below you have Bizad's comment showing woodcutters. So usually art historians will look at this and say, ah, oh, it's a charming genre scene. Everyday life in 15th century Herat's countryside. Well, what is happening here at the top is the story in, of Attar that's illustrated. Once upon a time, there was a holy man, a mullah, who had a regulation beard, you know, kabza, exactly, the four fingers worth, you're supposed to be able to seize it, and he was so proud of his beard. Have you ever been, if you've been to Afghanistan, you know those people who have these little mirrors for their uh, tobacco uh, pouch, and there's a little mirror on the box, and they sort of look at themselves, and they're constantly inspecting their mustache and their beard, and is it just right? And they're stroking their beards and combing their beards. And this character was just looking at his beard all the time. I've got a great beard. My beard is better than your beard. My beard is holier than your beard. And as he kept on looking at his beard in the little mirror, he didn't see that there was a swift river just in front of him, and he tripped over a stone, and he fell in. And here he is, drowning in the river. And he sees a bystander and calls for help. And the bystander says, my poor man, you are being dragged down by that donkey's nose bag that's hanging from your ears. You know how they feed donkeys, they put a nose bag so the donkey can feed in it. And the man says, this isn't a donkey's nose bag, this is my beard. And it's filling with water. I can't take it off. And Weissner says, well, basically, sorry about that. <laughs> and the mullet drowns. Drowned by the vanity of his huge beard, which is filled with water. And so the bystander is expected by the patron design to get the lesson. So the bystander stands between a tree in leaf and foliage, a living tree, and a dead tree. Spiritually alive or spiritually dead. And then Bizad is going to add his commentary, and you remember the rule. You look at an illustration of one poet with allusion to a second poet. Watch this. Woodcutters. And here, the poet. Who is he? Probably Attar. And Attar is pointing down. He's like, pay attention to what I'm saying. Understand the meaning. That's why he has this finger pointing down. And what is he pointing at? He is pointing at the chief of the woodcutters. Okay, very racist. Who is this? 15th century art. It represents somebody with a darkened face. That means he is the devil. And he has a ring in his ear, which means that he is a slave. Who can he possibly be? This is, in fact, Bizod's very witty 
quotation from Rumi added to make us better understand Attar and the story told by Rumi in the fourth book of the Masnavi is once upon a time there was a certain caliph who was very proud of his piety, especially showing off his piety to the people, never missed dawn prayers in front of everybody. I'm really a holy caliph. But one morning, he almost overslept, and there was a rustling in the curtains in his room, and a character comes and wakes up the caliph, and shakes him out of bed. The caliph says, wait, what's happening? And the character says, wake up, wake up, your majesty, it's almost dawn prayers, you're just about to miss them. Caleb says, oh, okay, but what are you doing in my room? Nobody's supposed to be in my room. And the character says, I am the devil. Caleb says, what the devil is the devil doing in my room, waking me up for dawn prayers? That's supposed to be holy. And the devil says, what does everybody blame me for? I am God's servant, just like everybody else. And my task is to go through this world as God's gardener. And every time I see a tree which is no longer watered by the water of life, is dry and withered. I cut it for hellfire. That is my task. That's why I shouldn't be blamed. Caleb says, well, I accept that you're God's servant, but I still want to get a, the proper answer from you. That's not why you woke me up. And he shakes the devil so hard that the devil finally confesses and says, well, okay, I admit, I woke you up for dawn prayers because you are so proud of your dawn prayers. If you had overslept and awoke late, you would have wept tears of repentance and humility, and those tears of humility would be more pleasing to God than your ostentatious arrogance about how well you pray early in the morning. And this is Bezad's addition to Attar's poem. This is a perfect illustration of dual illustration. We could, I don't, I don't think we have much time now, but we could conclude in this last marvel that Bizod painted for the 15th century portion of the book. And it represents, as you can see, a Sufi master, a peasant with his Boak team, and above three farmers weighing fruit and strangely, a Buddhist monk with a dog on a leash sleeping under a tree. What is this Chinese-looking Buddhist monk? He looks like a Lohan, Chinese worthy, or Arhat in Sanskrit. What is he doing in a Sufi Muslim painting? Look at him. What's he doing there? How is this possible? Now, we're not going to get into the discussion even though it is very pertinent, of the enormous Buddhist influence in the very rise of Sufism. We don't want to get into that argument, but there's a lot there. What is important here is that Biza has introduced this Buddhist-looking figure, the Buddhist worthy, with this finger pointing down. Important, important. Pay attention. What does this possibly mean? So if I go back here, I get the story of Atar, which is only this space. And then everything above is Bizad's comment. Do an illustration. Below, this is the story of a great Sufi master called Abu Sa'id ibn Abi Khair, Sheikh of Mana, 11th century, contemporary of Ibn Sina, very famous in his day. And like most of these Sufis, a manic depressive. Meaning, you know, of course, you know, when God speaks to me, I feel elated. And when I no longer hear God's voice, I feel very depressed. And this has lasted for a while. He's feeling very depressed. He's so depressed that he goes out for a walk in the surrounding countryside. And he sees a peasant, an old peasant, driving his bullock team. And the peasant is illuminated with what seems to be holy light. And the peasant turns to the wise old Sufi sheikh, the humble peasant and tells the Sufi Sheikh, Master, you have not yet learned the art of patience. Without patience, you cannot achieve sainthood. You want to know the meaning of patience? And the peasant says, once upon a time, there was a great mountain that rose from earth 
all the way to the moon, and it was composed entirely of millet seeds. Every century, a little bird comes and pecks one grain from this mountain. When the entire mountain will have disappeared, only a single, single second of eternity will have elapsed. And the shaykh is awed. That's the end of Attar's story. We know, and research shows it, that this is one of the many Buddhist stories that resurface in Central Asian Sufi literature, underwriting the continuity in spirituality. Why, however, does Bezad add this Buddhist figure here in commentary? Did he know the Buddhist origin of the story? Probably not. Actually, with a little research, we found out why. In the 15th century, as we mentioned, you had all these caravans going back and forth, the Silk Route, between Herat and Tabriz and Beijing. And one of the paintings that we know entered into the treasury, perhaps of the kings of Herat, but it went through Tabriz and it's now in Istanbul, so we know that this was seen by Muslim artists. It is a Chinese Buddhist picture representing a famous Buddhist worthy and his two servants who became his disciples. They have their servants broom, and they're all laughing, and they're very merry about it. And this was a roundel, which was then pasted by a Muslim scribe for his sultan on an album page, which you can see above. And we know that this painting inspired Muslim artists because we get from Master Sheikhi of Tabriz, contemporary of Bizad, in the 1490s, a variant of what he saw from the lost Buddhist picture, which represents the master, the two disciples, and a tame animal, which in this case, from the Buddhist original, is a tiger. And this character is pointing. See, see, pay attention. What does it mean? In Buddhist symbolism, it means the tiger represents the beast that is our physical self, tamed by the holy soul. We are not divided from our animal nature, but we dominate our natural, our natural physical person, and we sleep the sleep of the blessed. And then the Muslim artist, whose name is Sheikhi, adds the image of a bird looking up at heaven, signifying the soul looking towards the resurrection. Now, when you see this Islamic adaptation of the Chinese Buddhist original, then you get what Master Sheikhi did. He re-rendered the Buddhist original to represent what we described in the very first part of this talk, the seven sleepers of the cave and their tame dog. The dog replaces the tiger. And you have one character pointing down. See, see, understand? Tame the flesh. And this, in turn, inspires a whole tradition in Persianate art, as by Rezoye Abbasi in the very last years of the 16th century. You still get the round old motif. This is the mouth of the cave, the seven souls, which can represent seven prophets awaiting the resurrection. And one of them points appertain dog. You see it? Very clearly. So this is how we come to Bizad's variation on the prototype. This is his comment on what is happening here. He has used the Chinese Buddhist prototype to represent in stylization all seven of the seven sleepers. He sleeps, but he points down at what is happening here. The meaning of patience, we await the resurrection. And the resurrection is symbolized by these three farmers, one of whom is young and has no beard, one of whom is in young adulthood and he has a growing beard, and mature adulthood here, a full beard, the three ages of man. And the fruit they are weighing are our souls. So this is an allegory of Judgment Day, which we must patiently 
await. And we await between the tree of life with the water of life or the dry stump of damnation. So suddenly all these pictures become crystal clear. You, you, if you want me to stop here, because we have the next session. Yeah, we're running a little long time. Okay, so. So, take questions. Take questions, we'll come to the birds next session. Thank you. <laughs>
so many crimes, so much tyranny that is hanging about you like filth, and you are worried about what kind of clothes you wear for Friday prayers? The king bursts into tears, gets off his horse, takes off his royal robe, throws it on the saddle, tells his courtiers, take this back to the city. I will now become the disciple of this holy man. And the king turns into a beggar, the disciple of the holy man. But after three days, the holy man says to the king, uh, sorry, your majesty, but the three days of mandatory hospitality are over. Now, if you want to eat, I'm not just going to share what I get from, as a beggar, with the alms from the people. Now you have to work for a living. The king says, well, I don't know what to do. I'm a king. I can't work. I have no idea. Well, think of something, your majesty, or otherwise you will starve. The king looks around and he sees thorns in the desert. So he gathers these thorns into bushels and takes them to the city, comes into the market, and begins to sell these bushels as kindling wood. And the people weep to see their former king now become so humble and give him a little money with which he buys food. And so the holy man and the former king dwell together like that for 20 years and are consulted by everybody until the king dies and the holy man is still alive. And people come to ask the holy man and say, who was truly the most saintly, O reverend one? You or the former king? And the saint who had been so harsh with the king says, the king, because I just renounced the world, but he renounced the whole kingdom. Then Ibn Arabi says, when my uncle, the emir of Clemson, behaved this way, he reproduced the holy model of Sheikh Ibrahim ibn Adham. Oh, who is that? That's all Ibn Arabi had to say. Ibrahim ibn Adham is a legendary prince from what is now northern Afghanistan, Bakh, Bactria, from the 8th century of the Common Era, who is supposed to have been raised by the king and queen his father in a palace where he was not allowed to see old age, disease, or death, because the king and queen had had a vision that their son would abandon the throne to which he was heir if he ever saw these things. But as fate would have it, despite all the precaution of the king and queen, the prince of Balch demanded to go out of the palace. And when he rode out, he saw a miserable old man and he asked one of his wounds, what's the matter with this man? And ultimately, the prince learns the existence of old age, disease, and death. So he exchanges his clothes with the beggar, sends back his horse to the palace, and becomes, according to Sufi tradition, as told in the greatest detail by Attar in another of his books, The Memorial of the Saints, the Tazkirat al -Awriya, the first Sufi the first wandering dervish. He wanders with a begging bowl, and he is a transparent recreation of the archetype of the Buddha story. I hope I've answered your question there. There are many, many more examples of this, but it shows that the spiritual archetype very much continues, so that this confrontation between king and holy man that we saw in this painting is absolutely central to the whole perception of Sufi civilization. Remember this one? Many, many more, and we'll be seeing some of these things in Thursday's session. One more question? Yes, please. Well, I got many questions, but rather than ask them all, I want to thank you for sharing with us your tremendous knowledge and lifetime of research going across all these disciplines to read meaning into our medieval art forms. As a you know in Islam, God is very bad and especially when that this is not holy anymore. Anyway. And it's supposed I, to be filthy. Exactly. And then before that, they say it's a rice and then they 
good. They were a part of the family and supporting. And they mostly they're talking about that probably the dog because of the favorite of the Zoroastrians in that Islam prophet. I missed the first part of your explanation. Okay, really it means that Sufism does what Al Halaj describes as say everything the Axel Ma'ani. Yes. Meaning everything has a reverse meaning. So since the dog is unclean, the very fact that a dog accompanies the seven sleepers in the cave signifies we have overcome this superficiality. The dog is our lower nature, but he has become tame and so he becomes holy. And we bit the Maoni, we just switch it around. That's typical of a Sufi approach. So I hope I answered your question. In this case, I don't think it's Zoroastrian, but that's not. Okay. Thank you. Please. So, the story of seven sleepers predates Sufi thought in general because it's a Quranic story? Yes. The, the seven sleepers of Ephesus was one of the holiest shrines of the Byzantine Empire, Christian Byzantine Empire, which means that at the time of the Prophet Muhammad, it was one of the most famous Christian stories of that world. So that the Quran proposes this story to Muslims to meditate on the significance of one of the most famous stories of their time. So apparently these, the story is supposed to go back to the third century AD when these seven young Christians fled pagan persecution under the Roman Empire in the city of Ephesus, which is now in Turkey. And then they awoke when the Roman Empire became Christian. And so the the shrine in Ephesus was very famous as a pilgrimage center in the Byzantine Empire at the time of the Prophet, which is, as usual, the Quran proposes parables, stories, fables for people to dwell upon because they happen to be extremely familiar and awake a resonance, like the story of Christ giving life to the bird or resurrecting the dead person. Obviously, that's a Christian story, too. But it is included within the Quranic treasury of stories. I hope I've answered your question there. I'm afraid we're out of time, but come back on Thursday. Thursday.